It's not just, it's not surprising that he's modernist in some respects and conservative in another. The modernism and the conservatism are two sides of the same view. That, that's, that's my idea, that, that, that the, this Spenglerian view of the decline of the West fuels both his, as it were, nostalgia for a time when, you know, Beethoven and Mozart were the sons of God, and also his feeling that in this age, we can't write music like that without, as it were, chicanery, without dishonesty. And so, yes, he, 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 he's going to take an interest in jazz because jazz has a, even though he doesn't like it, and he, it, it's, he feels that it belongs to a culture that he feels alien to, nevertheless, it's an appropriate form of music for this period. It's similar to um, literature that he, he loved uh, American detective fiction because it was, he felt, exp you know, in keeping with the days and the times in which we live. So, the, the and, and likewise with modernist architecture, he might, he might enjoy classical architecture, so long as it's honest classical architecture, but to build, a, as it were, a, a bank in, a, in the style of a Greek temple uh, is, is for him, you know, strictly forbidden and uh, a sign of dishonesty. So, uh, it's all about... Um, Integrity and honesty. Two things. One quick one about the detective stories. Uh, I was just rereading something recently that's quite wonderful. Uh, Wittgenstein sent Piero Sraffa uh, a copy of Dashiell Hammett's Thin Man. He said, Don't think this is junk because it's coming from me. <laughs> <laughs> And it makes a, a very nice anecdote. Wonderful correspondence between the two of them. Um, they, they keep writing to each other. It's very clear we don't understand each other. My greetings to your mother. Uh, it, it, so it goes back and forth like that. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, once again, what does Wittgenstein say of his own philosophy? Maybe we can, we can uh, turn that curve here. He says, I wish that the kind of philosophy I, I, I'm writing would be superfluous. I would like to see a world, and here this conservatism turns into an ultra-radicalism, in which the kind of philosophy I'm doing is not necessary. Okay, let, let, let's turn, as Alan suggests, to, to, to the philosophy. Um, and the connection I'm about to make involves whistling. Um, Wittgenstein was a very accomplished whistler. He, as I said earlier on, he didn't, as a child, learn any instrument, but he was surrounded by music of the highest, very highest level. And he could whistle extraordinarily well, and he did do so often in public. I mean, he would sometimes be accompanied by a piano. Now, the connection with the philosophy is this, that in his first book, he put forward a, a theory of meaning. And there's a paradox at the heart of the book, which is this, that according to that theory of meaning, the sentences Wittgenstein uses to express it are themselves meaningless. They are, as, uh, in, in his kind of jargon, an attempt to say what can't be said. Now, Frank Ramsey, who was a very acute critic of the Tractators, the, the earliest work of Wittgenstein, used a marvellous phrase. He said, well, what you can't say, you can't say. And you can't whistle it either. <laughs> well now, to do with Wittgenstein and music, it seems to me one way into his thinking about music is, is through that remark, actually. Because I do think he thought that music could those, those remarks that you started with, those wonderful remarks that you started with, people nowadays think that scientists exist to entertain them, musicians and so on, uh, scientists exist to instruct them, musicians and so on to entertain them. But his view, his deeply felt view, is that music has something to teach us. But now if we ask, well, what? Now we're up against the limits of the sale, because we can't say what. Um, which, which ties in with your, one of your other quotes about how he's, you know, he, he once said, look, how can I be understood when I haven't been able to say one word about what music means to me? Well, he can't. 
because the meaning of a piece of music is something that cannot be put into words. And that is both the glory of music and, from the point of view of philosophizing about it, um, the, 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 the limitation of it. Um, so, but I, I, I think that's, that's a profound point. But you, you, Victor Sand claim is you can show things, right? Things can be made manifest. And um, I suppose this, uh, this house in, 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 in what, some shape or form is a manifestation of, of something. Is that right? In the tractate, one of the things you can't say is logic. Logic is, to use his, his phrase, transcendental. It's inevitable. His sister, Minnie, described this house as house-embodied logic. It does indeed, through the proportions, through, through uh, in, in the form of architecture, it does indeed try to express a kind of aesthetic, a kind of logic, that by its very nature cannot be put into words. Um, and I think that this was a, a common thread in, in Wittgenstein's uh, work and thinking, throughout his life, actually. He, in, the, in his later work, the Philosophical Investigations, he talks about two kinds of understanding. He says, you know, there, there, there are two ways of understanding uh, a form of words. There's one way of form of, you, you show that you understand what somebody said to you by putting it into your own words. But he said there's another kind of understanding, where you show that you understand what's being said by understanding that it cannot possibly be put into other words. And I think what he had in mind there was poetry. And there's a, there's a, a story in connection with this. Uh, the Vienna Circle um, took up Wittgenstein's tractatus but dismissed, abandoned what he said about mysticism and about the inexpressible. They thought that, that you know, the, the heart of Wittgenstein's work was the theory of meaning. And they invited Wittgenstein to come and discuss it. And when he did, he turned his back on them and read them the poems of Rabindranath Tagore, the Indian uh, mystic poet, as if to say, look, you know, the propositions of science, which is, you know, the, 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 the Vienna Circle published their manifesto, the scientific outlook, and Wittgenstein's point was, the scientific outlook misses the most valuable things that there are. This um, reference to literature, strangely enough, brings us back to music. Because one of the most interesting things that Wittgenstein uh, said about, uh, and he said on a number of occasions about a number of different people, uh, about, for example, Tagore, is that what impresses him so much is the tone. When he gets Trockel's poems, so 100 years ago, uh, he says, I don't understand them, but their tone pleases me. Uh, when he's speaking of Tagore, he says it's, it, 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 it's, it's the tone of a profound writer, like Henry Gibson. And Henry Gibson was in the Wittgenstein family, family the, 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 the non plus ultra as far as drama, and as far as literature went. I mean, Schnitzler, Hoffman, Stahlberg, sort of uh, dwarves in, in, in comparison with them. So the tone, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's their tone, it's, it's this, this ineffable, in, ineffable musical quality that, that you feel, in, uh, uh, that you, you can't put into words, that nevertheless, in some ways, overwhelms you, uh, that, 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 that he's after. And he, he realizes it's very difficult, it's very difficult to grasp. <coughs> He writes a wonderful sentence, Philosophie dürfte man eigentlich nur dichten. Now this is normally translated into English as philosophy can only be written as poetry. I, I don't think that's quite what he was after. He was after, he was after something else. He was after the idea that it has to be written in the form of fiction, dichtung in the broadest sense. But he said, it can really only be written that way. Which is to say, you can't quite, unfortunately, as a philosopher, you can't quite reach that. You can't quite reach that, that uh, what the, what, what, what the uh, poet, uh, what the composer is able to reach, the great ones. That is to say, to be the voice of God, if you like.
if I might just put, put this out here, um, so you can whistle. Um, so you can whistle meaning. Is that fair? Or at least internally. That somebody who's good at whistling can convey something through the musicality of their whistling, and that that whistling, what is conveyed there, cannot be put into words. Because it's... Sorry. Because it's logic, right? Music. <laughs> logic also cannot be put into words, but logic is not the same thing as music. No? <laughs> and that, 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 there's a wonderful topic in and of itself. I'm, I'm being told that we have to wrap this up, and I, I'm going to wrap it up with uh, two points about whistling. This, this statement of, of Frank Ramsey's is actually an allusion to, to Bernard Shaw's Madame Superman. Uh, Ramsey wasn't smart enough to think that up himself. Uh, the, 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 the second thing is that, uh, that Wittgenstein detested people who whistled classical music just because they were happy. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the point is, the point is, I mean, he, he, was, he was a dead serious person. Uh, it, you know, you couldn't just go around uh, whistling the Vogelfänger wie nicht ja, you know, be, 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 because, because it made you happy. You had to be concerned with the music. You had to be, and, 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 and not just excerpts, but the whole thing, it has to be through. <laughs> Wrap it up, right? I've been told to wrap it up. Oh yes, we have a question, of course. But well, okay, before before I, I put it up to the audience, um, let me just um, use something which I think kind of combines some some things, which is that we're talking about Mendelssohn and whether he was a genius or just talented and so on and so forth. The interesting thing is, you're, you're right. He probably wasn't really disparaging Mendelssohn because, after all, he compares himself directly to Mendelssohn. As uh, Wittgenstein uh, compares his, his design for this house to Mendelssohn's music, he says it's got good manners, but it's a, it's a hothouse plant. Anyway, um, questions? Yes. 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 Um, I want to just hear your opinion. There's a very interesting remark, I don't remember which manuscript, where Wittgenstein says, there are, let me first say in German, es gibt Probleme in der Philosophie, an die ich nicht herankomme. Möglicherweise ist Goethe herangekommen oder Beethoven und vielleicht ist Nietzsche daran vorbeigekommen, so ähnlich geht es. Also, there are problems in philosophy, I can't, can't even come close to them. And maybe Goethe was dealing with them or Beethoven was fighting with them. So, for me, the surprising thing is, he thought there are problems, common problems for philosophers, poets, and musicians, composers. They have the same kind of problems. So, this is very interesting for us. I totally agree. That, that remark is absolutely fascinating uh, and bewildering. Um, I mentioned it to, to, to Stephen and Alan when we were talking yesterday. I remember it slightly differently, though, because the, uh, I remember him mentioning Nietzsche rather than Goethe. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, so there, there are problems that Nietzsche touched on and that Beethoven, as it were, dealt with. And do we have any idea what those kind of problems are? I don't think we do, although there are hints uh, every now and again, that it's to do with, clearly in the broader sense, it's to do with understanding ourselves. And one of the hints is to do, it, it, it ties in with, with uh, his... Um, comments about Mendelssohn, one, one of the most striking comments about Mendelssohn is he says, in all great art, and this is the same one that Stevens alluded to, but, but the, the opening bit of it is, Wittgenstein says, in all great art there is a sense of a wild beast tamed. And he says, this is precisely what you don't have in Mendelssohn. And I feel absolutely sure he would have said, you do have that in Beethoven. And I feel sure that that has something to do with his sense that Beethoven uh, was dealing with problems that he himself, Wittgenstein, didn't deal with. Um, and I think we can bring those two remarks together. Uh, why didn't he deal with them? Well, um, he was too well mannered. <laughs> uh, just 
if I may, I'm just on that. Where, where does the, the concept of the genius come in, into all of this? Because, um, I mean, what, and what did Wittgenstein mean when he talked about genius? Because there are various origin sources for that. Well, one source that I make much of in my book is, is uh, Otto Weininger and uh, his view in Sex and Character that um, it's a duty to realise what genius we have and that nothing else is, 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 is worth anything. And there's a story I was told on Tuesday, and I'll tell it again, so forgive me people who were here on Tuesday. The story, is, it's told by Russell, that Russell, and, and took, Russell took Wittgenstein uh, to watch G. Moore's son uh, rowing um, in Cambridge and they went to the riverside and it was all very jolly and students were drinking and watching them rowing and having fun and Russell says to Otto that Wittgenstein suddenly stopped and looked absolutely devastated and he said to Russell the way we have spent this afternoon is so vile we ought not to carry on living <laughs> That's a very binding area concept. <laughs> Genius or death, that's the word. <laughs> T or death, no, that's something else. Um, questions, more questions? Yes. I wish you could tell the story about Ludwig and Paul, when Paul was. Yes. Oh, <laughs> right. Who would like to tell the story? Another? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this story um, goes that, that uh, uh, Paul Wittgenstein was practicing on the piano. Ludwig Wittgenstein was writing in a room next door. Suddenly the door bursts open and Paul Wittgenstein storms through and says, I can't carry on any longer. I can feel your scepticism seeping under the door. <laughs> Probably a suitable point to end. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much, Ray Monk and Alan Janik. I hope you've enjoyed this evening. Thank you.